everyone. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, so my talk today is entitled The Eliza Effect, or a talk about NPCs, gaps, and virtual reality. Um, so just to sort of introduce myself a bit, um, so I make games and I think about games. Uh, I'm a game designer and programmer. Uh, I run an indie micro studio called The Tiniest Shark, as mentioned. Uh, and there I basically make games generally about tiny computer people, their relationships, and aliens, I guess. Um, and as mentioned, I'm also in academia too. Uh, more recently, I've joined the NYU Game Center uh, as an assistant arts professor, but I also completed a PhD earlier this year at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Um, and there, my dissertation topic, uh, although related to games, was actually absolutely nothing to do with my love for simulating fake computer people, basically, um, or aliens for that matter. Um, and in this talk, I thought I'd use this opportunity to start resolving those two threads of interest that I've got, um, and you know, as well as some other things. So it might be a little bit experimental, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so I've just lost my mouse cursor. Um, OK, so um, and I think that you know, smoothing over those two subject areas, hopefully you know, one of the gaps to uh, address uh, in the talk. Um, OK, so um, really, this talk is uh, about how we relate to NPCs, both uh, emotionally and, and cognitively. Um, if nothing else, I hope to uh, present you with this sort of loose co collection of thoughts on how to do, th on, on, on doing things with NPCs, uh, how we portray their behaviours, and how we perceive them. Uh, so it's basically going to be, uh, I know you've had a very technical sort of morning set of sessions, but this is going to be more of a design slash player studies kind of talk. Uh, and not all of it is 100% AI related, uh, but maybe it'll just break up the day nicely for you. Um, so, um, you may or may not know uh, one of my previously released games called Red Shirt, um, which you're used to looking like this if you've played it. Uh, it's actually getting a refresh and re-release on tablet in the next few weeks, fingers crossed, uh, Apple. Um, and it's about to look like this. Um, so, a Red Shirt is uh, a social networking on a space station simulator, basically. Uh, and I'll come back to uh, a bit more about it in a second. Um, so I'm just giving you an overview of the games that um, I've worked on. I'm currently working on uh, another game uh, which is called Little Invasion Stories, uh, which is a city building citizen management game in which the player needs to alternately manage the happiness and disputes uh, and wants and desires of all their various citizens and also try to protect them from the inevitability of alien abduction, of course, as you do. Uh, it's basically a game that tries its hand at uh, procedural comedy uh, through the interactions of its citizens, uh, and it's still very much a work in progress. So I'm not really going to be talking about it today, but uh, just to give you an overview of what I'm working on right now. So, firstly, given the, t the title of the talk, don't worry, I do know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I know it's not the Eliza effect spelt like that. The Eliza effect is, of course, the name given to the uh, tendency that people have to ascribe intelligence, right? To ascribe sentience to computers with very little prompting required. Uh, it comes, of course, uh, from the famous set of, set of observations by uh, Joseph Weizenbaum uh, that computers can, uh, as he says, induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. Um, and so, you know, the abstraction present in computer representations like uh, the classic chatbot Eliza means that there are, of course, all of these gaps for the player to insert themselves into uh, and insert their own model for thinking about the world into. Um, quite simply, it's the idea that even in the cases of this sort of low fidelity simulation, uh, no matter how far it aspires towards, towards naturalism, uh, how far it aspires towards this like mimesis of reality, the player will be able to insert themselves into it. Um, so abstraction plus our weird human tendency to fill in the gaps uh, is pretty powerful that way. And... Um, so we can think of it, we can think of there being this spectrum between um, uh, abstraction and specificity. Um, so I was actually uh, at practice, uh, the game design conference we hold at NYU uh, all weekend, and uh, there were a bunch of uh, talks which kind of touched on this theme, um, uh, talking about the sort of 
uh, difficulty uh, of managing sort of uh, you know autonomous emergent narratives with with authored and prescriptive narratives um, and the sort of tensions between doing those things um, and uh, and yeah so we can think of this spectrum uh, existing between sort of NPCs behaving autonomously and uh, behaving through authored branching, uh, which is the same as this sort of uh, spectrum between abstraction at this end and more specificity uh, at that end. Um, and the systems-driven games at one end of the spectrum uh, sort of have all the uh, all the strengths that emergence affords us, right? The delight of the unexpected, the serendipitous feeling of, of order coming out of chaos, um, of something that happens in the game having happened just for you. Uh, I did a GDC micro talk uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, in which I called that these sort of tiny moments of awe that you experience when you've uh, stumbled across something that nobody else has done. Um, Emergent systems with their capacity to evolve and surprise are also infinitely replayable. Uh, no situation will ever play out in necessarily the same way twice. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, obviously, we have the, uh, the uh, enormous emotional nuance that's available to us uh, through well-crafted writing, right? A human being with all their range of experience can tell a story with layers of nuance and understanding that no autonomous agent or emergent system can match. That's a uniquely human strength. Um, so, you know, at one end of the spectrum, we have the delight uh, that comes out of watching and interacting with emergent systems, and at the other end, the emotional involvement that comes from, um, that comes from specific authored stories. Um, and I don't think necessarily, I'm always very careful to say that I don't think one end of the spectrum is more valuable than the other. Um, I, in my work, am just more interested in this sort of uh, end of the spectrum. Uh, so I'm going to step back again and talk about my work briefly. Um, so in terms of tiny computer people, their relationships and aliens. Uh, so Redshirt is entirely a game that uh, plays out through the Eliza effect, right? Um, so if you don't know about Redshirt, uh, like I said, it's the social networking on a space station simulator uh, in which players take on the role of this, uh, this newly arrived space janitor, effectively, trying to work their way up, their way up the uh, career and social ladders uh, aboard the, your space station. Um, and uh, the station is populated with, uh, with a couple of hundred uh, unique uh, AI-driven characters. They all have their own um, different uh, personalities, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and the interactions in the game are exclusively done through this sort of mock Facebook interface. Um, so you're able to, uh, you know, as, as the player and as NPC, so I've listed out a, um, a, uh, a list of the, the, the actions that NPCs can take. Uh, all of them are to do with sort of interacting through, uh, through this social networking working interface. Um, so as a player, um, it's possible to play completely nicely, right? You might want to work your way up the career and social ladders uh, just by working diligently, going to work, um, you know, and making friends in order to just sort of keep your character happy, maintain this kind of healthy work-life balance. Um, however, a lot of people uh, find themselves playing transgressively, uh, whether accidentally or otherwise. Uh, in fact, my favorite stories from players are when they recount how they tried to play the game nicely, but instead found themselves scheming their way up the career tree, uh, strategically liking only posts by their boss, uh, worming their way into their boss's social circles, or even at the more extreme end of the spectrum, dating the hiring manager for a given job and dumping them as soon as they uh, have the promotion before moving on to the next target. Um, so it can be very Machiavellian and uh, kind of uncomfortable that way too. Um, but what I wanted to sort of mention was Redshirt explicitly uh, limits the system. It's a game about ambition, right? Whether that's related to uh, your career or social ambition. Um, but other than that, um, the sort of way that you uh, identify yourself, the way that you sort of create your identity in Redshirt is very fluid because it's also a game about how, uh, you know, we are we are who we are as on, on social media. Like our profiles define us, right? Um, so the things that other people see about us are the way that other people sort of think about us. Um, so just to move on to um, how, uh, how the various NPC personalities work in Red Shirt. So NPCs uh, have um, uh, five fixed attributes, which you can, um, you know, which are generated uh, when you first create a game. Uh, so there's uh, 
there's a bigotry attribute, there's a chattiness one, there's vanity, quirkiness, and fickleness. Um, and as the player, um, you're able to, on the character creation screen, uh, sort of select a slider for how many of the, the, the sort of percentage of, uh, the percentage of NPCs who have like, you know, chattiness as like their primary attribute or have vanity as a primary attribute, or you can sort of go for a balance. So as a player, you can sort of toggle those, uh, those different attributes and sort of see what kind of station you end up with. Maybe you want to be on a station full of bigots for some reason. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, there are these uh, five uh, fluid or variable attributes as well. So things like happiness, sociability, confidence, altruism, and inspiration. Um, so, you know, like I said, Redshirt um, is a game about uh, how you're perceived by others. Uh, so, um, you know, simply liking uh, a bigoted status uh, can make an NPC appear to be less altruistic to others. Um, so something like the altruism, altruism attribute being variable uh, means that an NPC who doesn't have the fixed attribute of altruism, of, of, uh, of bigotry, can still be dragged down if they have a load of bigoted friends uh, whose statuses they've decided to like for some reason. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and for example, like if somebody, if, uh, if uh, an NPC whose uh, primary attribute is, is bigotry is feeling happy and confident, they'll have no problem posting terrible uh, sexist and xenophobic things on Facebook, of course, um, as we often see with elderly relatives on, uh, on Facebook. Um, so, you know, Red Shirt was kind of an attempt, uh, you know, to, to sort of pair social commentary um, with emergent gameplay um, and to just sort of see the kind of interesting outcomes that occur. Um, and, you know, and it was, done, uh, it was done through explicitly limiting the interactions to, uh, you know, to those which take place through, uh, through social media. Um, so I wanted to also, you know, so basically Red Shirt uh, totally worked by the Eliza effect. Um, and there are specific actions which actually remained a mystery. So this is uh, the original code uh, for an NPC deciding what to do with a relationship request they've received. Uh, and other, do other than doing sort of basic checks for sexual preference and whether they already have a crush on the requester, you'll see that a lot of the role is based on this sort of additional romantic predisposition variable that NPCs can have as well. Uh, because sometimes these things are just a mystery and leaving this open to the player's interpretation um, actually ended up being sort of kind of more interesting. Um, sort of I had a, uh, a lot of uh, sort of back and forth about how I was going to model love in the game and then ultimately en ended up deciding to do that. Um, so, you know, you can play Red Shirt uh, sort of subversively um, and I think it's an example of the kind of play that puts us uh, at odds with ourselves, right? Um, that highlight the gap between who we are, if we're trying to play sort of honestly, and who the procedural representation of the game will allow us to be. Um, a simulation can't simulate everything, of course. Um, the things we leave out when we're designing a game are often more interesting and more expressive than the things that we put in. Uh, and play operates on that gap, right? It entices us to fill it in. Uh, it's the same principle in many ways. I'm sure you're all familiar with the often referred to example uh, by Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics. Uh, the less fidelity we put into something, the more room there is for us to fill the gap with ourselves. So modeling social dynamics of humans is obviously always going to be a bit reductive, right? Um, I'm sure we can't uh, distill everybody down to sort of bigotry and uh, chattiness and vanity and all these things. Uh, maybe we can, but it's very reductionist to do so. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's about being, um, you know, about doing some sort of doing conscientious reductionism, uh, as aspiring towards uh, basically procedural believability rather than social believability. Um, so we're not trying to get to these naturalistic characters who can uh, do anything and say anything, uh, but instead it's about you know, what we can say about people uh, and the world that they inhabit through the actions and behaviours that they can or can't take. Um, so, you know, like I said, the wonderful thing is about you know, the, the, the things that we uh, leave out are often more interesting than the things that we leave in. Um, so some examples in other games, so of course uh, the hello world of social simulation games uh, can be considered to be gossip, um, which is ultimately a game about how much people sort of liked each other and that sort of affected this tiny social network of sorts. Um, and you know, and the way that gossip worked was of course that characters could only express sort of one of three different uh, stances on the other characters. They can be sort of positive, neutral or negative. Um, 
And in a way, the sort of fact that the system is so limited just speaks to, it kind of tells you something about gossip, right? The nature of, of humans being, uh, being sort of you know, entities who, who can only uh, sort of talk about each other in these very sort of uh, simplistic ways. Uh, so it kind of says something about gossip and, uh, and, and how sort of pointless it is, I guess, maybe. Um, so, you know, they're beings who only know how to talk about each other and, and nothing else. Um, so, you know, we can also think about how uh, the sort of social implications of, uh, of, of limiting the system. Um, Tomodachi Life is a, is a game I, I really love. Um, there's lots of, uh, you know, lots of gaps for you to fill in as, as the player. Um, but unfortunately, it also uh, sort of, you know, limits uh, the kinds of relationships in the game. Um, there was obviously a big, uh, you know, a, a big story about how um, the game had this very sort of exclusively heteronormative uh, outlook and didn't allow for, um, for same-sex relationships. Um, and we can compare that to something like Kitty Powers Matchmaker, which is primarily a puzzle game uh, about sort of running this, this dating agency uh, in which you're trying to pair off characters, these procedurally generated characters against each other, um, or with each other, I should say. Um, and, you know, and it's re really a game to which inclusiveness is essential because you're navigating the, the dating lives of clients based on their interests and their various sexual orientations. Um, and their personality types. And I think by doing that, it kind of really says something uh, sort of nice and universal about, um, you know, just how, about the universe, universality of, of awkward first dates and, um, and, and, you know, needing to hold in farts as well, apparently, if during dates, that's a, that's a joke in the game. Um, so I think, um, you know, Shadow of Mordor as well, very quickly, um, is uh, one of my favorite implementations of, sort of, you know, like a basic system of social simulation uh, because it kind of communicates its purpose without needing to be uh, massively complex. Um, so you're, uh, you know, I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, of the sort of orc nemesis system in the game, um, which I like to think of as kind of like an orc soap opera, right? It's really about uh, orcs vying for position uh, amongst their own ranks. Um, and again, it's sort of, you know, very, uh, you know, it's very reductionist um, and quite simple, but it kind of works because they're orcs, right? Um, and, even, uh, and even in the sort of, uh, you know, weirdly problematic and essentialist sort of Tolkien uh, world in which orcs are kind of, you know, othered, et cetera, it kind of makes you care about them. It kind of makes you care about their drama, uh, which is nice. Um, so, um, and, you know, and, and in their little invasion stories, um, you know, it's, it's kind of... Um, uh, about how game, uh, about how the citizens are sort of, you know, they're, they're, they're just sort of uh, so bent on sort of their sort of territorial disputes with each other, um, and they're sort of limited in in that way. Um, so, you know, basically what I was trying to say is that social simulations are meaningful thanks to the gaps in their procedural re representation, right? Um, and really, that's the virtue of social simulation, the ability to present us with systems that bring into uh, sharp relief uh, the way we think about people and the world around us. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, one of the nice things is that, you know, uh, social simulation can be very inclusive, right? Because everybody, no matter how games literate you are or otherwise, everyone kind of has a model of, of how the social world works. Um, so I wanted to bring up um, uh, a, a wonderful talk that Anna Kipnis of Double Fine actually gave over this weekend at practice, uh, in which she talked about these sort of similar, similar themes of uh, expressive simulation. And she mentioned how simulating real life actions in the stamping, uh, like, you know, like stamping in Papers, Please, um, actually helped enhance the narrative experience of the game. Um, and that kind of works uh, because our experience of the world is embodied, right? We are embodied agents who find out things about the world through acting. Um, and so on that note, I want to sort of veer into uh, trying to resolve this with, uh, with, my, uh, with my thesis work. Um, because I want to sort of trouble everything that I just said as well, right? Because... Um, Right, so this is actually my third conference in the last 10 days, and I feel like, depending on where you go and what the outlook is in that particular space around games, there's often an elephant in the room. Uh, and it might not be a particularly big elephant, depending on who you tend to talk to about games and the conversations that you pay attention to. Uh, it might be a really tiny elephant, uh, but I can assure you it's there. 
And that tiny elephant uh, is often to do with uh, immersive technologies like VR and what it means for the way that we need to be thinking about and designing games. Uh, and especially the very differing attitudes around things like VR um, amongst many different communities of games thinkers. Now, I hope I'm not setting up too much of a straw man uh, while I'm doing this, because I'm sure that you know, most of us do hold very nuanced positions on VR and what it can be. Let's give, uh, let's give him a straw hat nonetheless. Um, but when it comes to the idea of technologies which kind of move us to further along this kind of embodied model of interaction, like move us closer to the holodeck, if you will, uh, there is kind of a rift. Uh, not that kind of rift, but let's give him a hat as well while he's there. I mean, this kind of rift. Um, so it's a rift in some ways between two kinds of ideologies about what it is that we should be working towards in games. Like what is it we're aspiring towards? Um, on the one hand, there's this idea of working towards the idea, uh, the, the, uh, working towards the idea of games as these complete realities, right? These uh, sort of complete realities indistinguishable from our own on this, on this sensory level. Uh, the thinking that the more realistic a game is, the better it is. And on the other hand, we can think of, like I've been sort of exp uh, expressing, games as these engines of interrogation. Uh, through explore, exploring systems and rules, we can better understand the world around us. Um, you know, thanks to those purposefully limited procedural representations, like I mentioned. Uh, or we can even frame it another way, uh, the kind of model of character-based game design that I've been talking about with procedural believability versus the full sort of, uh, you know, holodeck-esque fantasy of social believability. And, um, you know, ever since I started uh, thinking about games um, seriously, oops, I don't know what happened there, um, I've sort of fallen into that camp over there, right? Um, you know, it's, it's my aspiration as a games maker to make games which are this kind of slow bombardment of uh, opportunities for self-reflective thought, basically. Um, so, you know, this is, a, this is a kind of, you know, rift, a gap that exists between two ways of thinking about games. Um, and it's one that I'm particularly cognizant of, uh, particularly lately, because um, I, uh, you know, well, the first of the three conferences I attended um, in the last 10 days was, um, was a conference in Germany where I was keynoting together with Janet Murray, um, who I also presented a version of this to, and she was incredibly nice about it, so I was, uh, I was relieved about that. Um, but uh, it's also something I'm very cognizant of because um, uh, a lot of my, my colleagues at the, uh, at the NYU Game Center have been known for being very outspoken on this topic, right? Um, so, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, in Eric Zimmerman's uh, Rules of Play, uh, which he wrote together with Katie Salen, he defined the term the immersive fallacy to refer to the widespread but seldom examined idea of realism and immersion uh, as the sort of ultimate end, end goals for games. Um, and also Frank Lance as well um, gave a rant at the Game Developers Conference like 10 years ago now, uh, where he summed up the idea by saying uh, that the word bear would not be better if it had teeth and could kill you. Um, or indeed this photo of a bear that I found, which is also just a representation. Don't worry, it's not a real bear. Um, and it wouldn't be better if we were being attacked by it right now, right? Um, so, you know, they contend that the danger... Oops, no, I have there. Um, they contend that the danger of the immersive fallacy is that it kind of misrepresents how play functions, right? It mis misrepresents how um, all the things I've been talking about, about play as being about filling in the gaps uh, between ourselves and the system of the game. So we can question the idea that what is truly desirable in games is eliminating those gaps, that the pleasure of uh, media experience lies in its ability to transport the player into this sort of whole other world. Um, and, you know, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a conception of games which is more in line with, like, you know, Brechtian ideas of uh, media as a means to allow you to uh, sort of interrogate the world without slipping into uh, immersive passivity. Um, and more importantly, what does it all mean for, our, uh, for interacting with characters uh, as the inevitable, what does it mean for the way that we interact with characters as the inevitable onward march of technological process, uh, regardless of how we feel about it, leads us shuffling gingerly towards the holodeck. Um, so as someone who's interested uh, in games as these engines of, inter of systemic interrogation, and yet also happy for, um, 
and also happy for uh, exploration of our medium and what it could do, um, I think I have a way to resolve these two things. Um, resolve these two disconnected conceptions of games and smooth over the gaps. Uh, and the basis of that comes from the, uh, the work that I did for my dissertation. Um, so, is this going to change? Okay, there we go. Um, smoothing over the gaps. That was a nice animation. Uh, so, just very quickly, um, so, you know, concerns about the immersive fallacy aren't new, right? They go back to, uh, you know, the, the history of art is full of uh, similar concerns, uh, like the ideas of Samuel Taylor, Taylor Coleridge, who uh, sort of said that the goal of theatre shouldn't be to transport the viewer. Um, it's a concept rooted in concerns about the sort of narrowing aesthetic distance between a, play, between a viewer and an artwork, uh, such that they can't sort of separate what they're doing from reality. Um, so, you know, there's always been these, these cycles in the history of art between, uh, you know, to, between uh, aspiring towards realism, aspiring towards this mimesis of reality, uh, and not, and sort of, you know, critiquing that idea and moving away from it. Um, and the history of art and theatre also offers us an insight into maybe how we can uh, solve that conflict that exists right now in games. Um, you know, for example, there was the... Uh, the um, you know, the anti-naturalist, anti-realist position on theatre, which was subverted in the early 20th century uh, by the avant-garde movement, who believed that the crossing and erasing of the boundaries that had traditionally split and limited the effectiveness um, and influence of art. Um, so, I wanted to take a more nuanced look at the picture. Um, while prioritizing, um, prioritizing immersion to the exclusion of all else, uh, that is valuable about games may, rip, may misrepresent how play functions. Uh, we're nevertheless at this point, like I said, this sort of onward uh, shuffle towards uh, towards um, sort of something that looks more like the holodeck one day. Um, so I want us to better understand that and what, what it means for the way that we think about games and, and how we relate to characters within games. Um, so after all, if playing with distance, uh, can yield uh, interesting new movements and types of expression in other media, maybe it can do the same in, in games. So, um, and okay, and we can also think about how, um, you know, as we move up this spectrum of embodiment, um, it's important to knowledge, of course, that play has always been uh, physical to an extent, um, but we can also think about the extent to which they're sort of physically embodied in a game where they have an avatar, and the actions that the player performs uh, has this one-to-one -one mapping with that avatar. Um, and that's what I'm sort of calling interface mimesis and all this, just to um, give, you a, sort of give you some context for that. Um, that way, they're not just embodied in a participative sense in a game, like they might be in something like Flower, for example, uh, but the extent to which the interface they're using is actually mimetic in some way. Um, and so, you know, to be clear, um, when I'm talking about interface mimesis, I mean that in a very inclusive sense. Um, and referring to like a designed property of the sort of relationship between the controller and, and uh, the rest of the game design. Uh, all kinds of interfaces which seek to map a player's real life body or movement uh, to their in-game avatar, um, seeing as, you know, uh, basically at yeah, the extent to which that happens, um, seeing as the body has always been implicated in play to some extent. Um, so even classic controllers count, uh, even though they might not be as mimetic as head tracking, which in turn may not be as mimetic as whatever the hell this guy is doing. Um, so um, what happens to that gap between the player and their, and their character as they uh, use these sort of mimetic, m immersive interfaces? Uh, how do interfaces shape how they think about uh, what they're doing and relate to the rest of the game? And what about specifically games which ask, uh, which ask us to act in transgressive ways towards other NPCs, like in Red Shirt or in something like Papers, Please? Um, we can think about these types of interactions as being morally significant in some way. They uh, operate thanks to play putting us at odds with ourselves, as I mentioned, right? Thanks to play requiring this sense of double consciousness. Um, and so, you know, that's how I'm sort of basically defining morally significant, right? The player has agency over decisions that have sort of dramatic consequences for NPCs, because uh, I was interested in what that means for how the player relates to the NPCs. Um, so my doctoral work involved a bunch of sort of um, short sort of mixed methods, empirical um, uh, experiments to sort of try and explore that. But I'm just going to talk about the largest study I did uh, in which I designed and built this short uh, game scenario in which players uh, were basically rock climbing. It was a game about rock climbing with an NPC partner 
uh, who would basically lead you up the rock face. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the character's name was Sarah. She was actually entirely scripted, right? So she was um, kind of at the author branching, specificity end of the spectrum. Um, and, uh, but I sort of left the relationship between the player and the NPC kind of ambiguous. So, um, so you know, the player would basically choose what context for the relationship they wanted to sort of set up in their head. Um, and so the player would climb up the rock face uh, using a uh, sort of mimetic uh, razor hydro controller. Uh, once they'd almost reached the top, there was a pre-scripted event uh, which was triggered whereby the anchor broke away, leaving the player um, dangling precariously from the rope with, with Sara, the climbing partner, uh, also dangling below. And you realize that the rope isn't going to be enough to support you both. Um, and then she makes this emotional plea for you, the player, to cut her loose. Um, and to uh, take out the knife. Um, and then it's up to the player whether they want to actually enact this uh, mimetic cutting action uh, and, um, and, you know, and basically sacrifice Sara. Um, and if you decide not to act or if you wait too long, uh, Sara gets increasingly panicky and emotional until eventually you both plummet to your death. So it's the old classic cut the rope uh, trope. Um, so I set up a two-part study. Uh, in the first part, uh, it was a between-participant study. Uh, players played the game either looking at a traditional fixed monitor or looking at a monitor and wearing a head tracking device or by using an Oculus Rift. Um, so not only head tracking, but also having the full 3D stereoscopic, stereoscopic display. Um, and then I got them to fill out all kinds of uh, quantitative self-report questionnaires, both pre- and post-exposure, and completed an interview. Um, so this is just one of the questionnaires I used. So I actually used um, sort of like already validated uh, questionnaires from other types of media. Um, so this is actually questions adapted from uh, a study of aesthetic distance in uh, literature to do with rape. Um, so it was about sort of you know, depicting troubling scenarios in literature and sort of looking uh, empirically at what that meant for the reader's experience. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and, and I used various other questionnaires looking at sort of, you know, aesthetic experiences here to reported guilt, to checking for, um, you know, checking that the manipulation was successful by looking at spatial presence and perceived control and naturalness, et cetera. Um, and I took a few other quantitative measures like how long it took the player to decide to cut the rope um, and whether they did cut the rope or not. Um, and so very quickly, like here are the findings. Um, so there was quite a lot. So I'm going to just focus on the ones which were sort of particularly to do with the NPC and how the, uh, the player thought about them. So as players had this increased sense of embodiment, so using the more sort of immersive interface, um, it increased their feelings of engagement. Uh, it also increased the time they took to cut the rope, to decide to cut the rope. Um, it also uh, affected how guilty they felt. Uh, and also their sort of empathy with their, with their player character, uh, how tense they felt, how far they thought the decision they took was an emotional one as opposed to like a, like a cognitive one, um, and the extent to which they felt that knowing that it was a fictional scenario made a difference to how they felt about it. Um, and then uh, I also did a second follow-up part where people who didn't play the game using the Oculus Rift had a chance to compare it to the Oculus Rift version. And then sort of I did, a, did an interview as well. But, uh, um, you know, and, and it showed some sort of interesting, uh, interesting results, uh, which could have been in part due to the novelty, so that data was given less significance. Uh, but they said things like, so people who played it in both conditions said things like, uh, the second time I felt proper bad. It was more emotionally affecting. Uh, part of me ho hoped there was going to be another way. I felt bad. Uh, the first time it felt more functional, and this, in the second instance, I was thinking more emotionally. Um, so overall, throughout, you know, we can, like, coll collating the results of the two sort of uh, parts of the study, we can see how players had, like, greater emotional and cognitive involvement with the scenario and with the climbing partner, Sarah, the, uh, the NPC. Um, and... And so oh, this was so this was showing the time taken to uh, to cut the rope as well um, in each instance. Um, and the interesting thing was though that despite that very clear difference in results uh, in empirical results, the sort of uh, qualitative follow-up interview that I did um, showed that even players who uh, you know despite all that players still had this sense of double awareness. They still sort of 
talked about their experience in this very conflicted way, uh, in which they said things like, it was weird because you felt like you were there, but you weren't, you were here, and oh man, it was weird. Uh, and, you know, it's more like you're in it, but you knew that it's not real. Um, uh, you know, and, and there were people who were you know, very much still at one end of the spectrum or another, but they still, you know, throughout the interview said things which, uh, you know, which, which showed that they, they, they you know, they, they still had this sort of uh, double awareness of what was going on. So one player said that uh, they found it incredibly difficult to deal with having to cut the rope and they could have used another moment once it was over. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and someone else saying that they felt like the part of their brain that knows what it is to play games felt that they had to do it to progress. Um, so overwhelmingly, you know, there was this sort of just, the, just a game attitude amongst the participants. Um, you know, this sense of double consciousness, of double awareness uh, about what they were doing. Um, so I think all of that, you know, maybe that's hardly surprising, right? Because all of that confirms that even when we're in this VR environment, there's still some part of ourselves which acknowledges that. Uh, it's this sort of willing suspension of disbelief, uh, underscored with, by the acknowledgement of the fictionality of what we're experiencing. Um, Kendall Walton in his book, Mimesis is Make-Believe, uh, says that fictional worlds can seem to us almost as real as the real world, even though we know perfectly well that they're not. Um, so it's not just that immersive and mimetic interfaces can maintain the double consciousness of play. I think that we should specifically design games in order to do so. They should strive to do so through the way we design, um, through the way we design games. Um, and all of that actually also um, echoes um, the way that actually even, uh, even in the sort of early, uh, early studies looking at ELISA, uh, people still had this, you know, this sense of double consciousness. Um, so uh, Sherry Turkle uh, wrote about how um, you know, people, uh, people would embark on this all-out effort, all effort to psych out the program uh, in order to understand its structure, in order to trick it and expose it as a mere machine. But others would do the opposite, right? Like people would uh, specifically strive to, uh, to, to maintain their suspension of disbelief. Um, and so I think all of that begins to point to something very important, this possible resolution between games as these engines of systemic interrogation and the ideals of the holodeck. But it doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily mean supplanting games which achieve this without needing to aspire to, uh, to virtual reality. The value of Papers, Please, for example, is not diminished by an experience like Project Syria. Um, you know, the Oculus Rift experience, um, you know, we can call it a game, about experiencing life in Aleppo and navigating the streets as, um, as a mortar shell explodes. Um, so, you know, all of, these, uh, all of these findings, I think, sort of support uh, this idea, again, from Mimesis Make Believe that Walton was talking about, uh, about representations, arousing emotions that we know to be fictional, uh, but can also be actual, this kind of duality uh, that we can also see in, you know, in, in, um, in the way that Sherry Tur Turkle talked about people interacting with Eliza originally. Um, so when we as players um, engage with uh, morally significant or transgressive situations in games where we're, uh, you know, where we're dealing with NPCs and, and, you know, the way we relate to them, we're participating in its fiction. And if the formal properties of that game support your fiction, then that fiction might be felt more strongly, maybe even to really quite an upsetting extent, right? Even though it still remains a fiction, uh, even though it might be felt as actual. It's that weird, um, you know, amb ambiguous sort of duality, right? Uh, and play is ambiguous, of course, that way, as lots of, you know, lots of great scholars have written, written about. So we can begin to think about what embodied critical play might look like, um, to just borrow and modify a term from Mary Flanagan. Um, still situating games in the broader context of sort of artistic interventions designed to make us sit up and take stock of the world around us, but also, you know, turn towards it a critical eye. Um, but critical, embodied critical play, which I'm defining, uh, is this design goal. Uh, in order for embodied critical play to be supported, a morally significant game or socio-political video game uh, involving sort of having uh, agency over what happens to an NPC um, must elicit a strong sense of embodiment. Uh, so that means it needs to support feelings of body ownership, agency, self-location, and uh, perceived control and naturalness. And the interface mimesis doesn't need to be defined by matching an avatar's movements with, um, with a player's gestural actions um, 
sort of in any, you know, it doesn't need to use uh, immersive interfaces in the way, you know, we might think about them. Um, because in something like, something like Redshirt, the action you're doing uh, is actually mirroring the real life equivalent, right? Like uh, navigating with a, with a social network uh, interface. Um, and also we can think about games such as, um, you know, uh, the death from above scenario in Call of Duty 4, which was incredibly jarring uh, because it actually, you know, mirrored the way that, uh, the, that these things work in the real world, which kind of really just opposes you to the things that you're doing in the game. Um, so it's no, no, by no means sort of like a new uh, concept, but I think by giving it the name embodied critical play, we can sort of think about um, how we can strive to design games in that way, to sort of oppose us with the things we're doing in the game through um, embodied actions. Um, so, you know, embodied critical play means designing for the players uh, physical mapping to the game to simulate the equivalent real life action, whether that's by means of something like a VR headset or not. But I just want to point out that that's only one half of the equation. Um, because I want to be very careful to say that uh, thinking about immersive interfaces for critical intervention, um, there's been this plethora of writing over the past couple of years about how VR might be fostering this new era of teaching us to be empathetic through these kinds of experiences. But I want to make the point that while VR experiences like Machine to be Another might seem like they fit the bill for embodied critical play, for helping us think through, you know, system, uh, think through um, sort of, you know, the real world by the way we interact with it through VR. Um, this actually falls short, and I'll explain why. Um, so if you haven't heard of Machine to be Another, it's a couple of headsets and cameras mapped to each other uh, in which you swap bodies with another participant. Um, therefore, you can potentially see through someone else's eyes and potentially swap gender, as the game says. And along similar, line, along similar lines, there's been other VR experiments um, at other institutions like the University of Barcelona, Royal Holloway in London, um, which saw participants uh, inhabit the body or just the hand or whatever of someone with darker skin, their, darker skin than their own. Um, and these experiments showed a great uh, reduction in implicit racial bias, which I thought was interesting. And of course, that's great as this like tiny step, um, but it doesn't lead us towards this deeper understanding of um, why inequalities exist in the first place. Uh, it doesn't lead to a deep systemic understanding of privilege. So if we're attempting to design games for embodied critical play, we need to think beyond simply inhabiting other bodies or interacting in the world in some superficial way. We can't forget about the value of procedural representation still, of designing for critical play. And I think a good litmus test is this. Even without the use of an immersive interface, does your game work as a procedural representation of the thing that you're trying to simulate? Uh, so do the rules and affordances of the game through their specifically designed limitations lead to this sort of procedural rhetoric which supports your message about how, uh, about the kind of social interactions you're presenting, about the kind of view of the world that you're presenting? Um, and if so, how does the interface further work to support that, uh, to make the game more persuasive? On that note, uh, Ian Bogos wrote um, of Manhunt 2's re-release back in 2009 that the game's coupling of gestures to violent acts makes, the, makes them more, not less repugnant by implicating the player in their commitment. Uh, in Manhunt 2, we're meant to feel the power of Daniel Lamb's psychopathy alongside our own disgust at it. It's a game that helps us to see how thin the line can be between madness and reason by making us perform abuse. Now, in many ways, Manhunt 2 isn't the best example because ultimately it's not a super interesting game in terms of the thing it's saying. But it does kind of point to the way that the pairing of procedural rhetoric and, and immersive and mimetic interfaces um, that we can work towards in designing for embodied critical play. Um, for mature and virtuous adult players, certainly it takes advantage of that gap between who we are and who the game is asking us to be. So I'm proposing um, this sort of idea uh, as this design goal for, for interaction with video games, which you know, refers to video games which seek to address morally significant themes um, by explicitly evoking this strong sense of embodiment in the player. Um, there is room within this concept for an increased sense of embodiment and effective procedural rhetoric to still exist, coexist even, particularly when dealing with subject matter that's, um, that's sort of socio-political in some way. Um, 
And an increased sense of physical embodiment, it can be argued, may allow for a procedural rhetoric that's more visceral and powerful by physically committing the player, um, by, you know, by committing the actions of the player to their real world, uh, their real world physical body. Um, so I think it helps us find this nice middle ground between these two conceptions of games, these two ideologies of games, uh, the two sort of straw men that I set up earlier. Uh, it kind of helps us smooth over the gap. Um, and has play always been embodied critical play? Yes, definitely to an extent. Um, and I don't think I'm defining a new type of design. Um, but I think giving this a name helps designers frame their thoughts around this and better design for these kinds of experiences. A uh, conception of presence still within the double consciousness of play, where we can be simultaneously our fictional selves and our real selves um, through these sort of consciously designed moments of reflection or like, or making you very uncomfortable about the thing you're performing and thus setting you up in opposition with it. So what is all this leading towards? Um, all of it is kind of a way of sort of resolving, uh, like I said, the two sort of strands of, of thinking about games, right? But it's also, I guess, sort of a personal exercise in resolving my own personal ideology about games. Um, and sort of, you know, as someone who uh, is, is interested, uh, you know, who, who loves games and is interested in uh, how they can evolve and widen as a medium, um, you know, how, how, you know, still uh, investigating technology, um, can, can still sort of help us to find new forms of expression uh, in games that we didn't have before. Um, on that note, um, I just wanted to sort of uh, start wrapping up, um, you know, because I think, you know, knowing, knowing all of that really helps uh, open up the space to experiment with naturalistic interaction with characters, while also, as I said, building in spaces for reflection amongst those experiences. Having it apparent to you that the game is simultaneously fictional and full of possibility for action and for reflection. So with all of that in mind, um, another thing I'm working on um, it right now is a startup uh, working on things like natural language processing and natural conversations. Um, and uh, we're already partnered with, um, with IBM Watson. Um, and you know, we're basically looking at bringing natural conversations to VR games and otherwise through using Watson's sort of natural, natural language processing capabilities, uh, including speech to, speech to text, text to speech, etc., and also its sort of co concept recognition and expansion capabilities. Um, so, you know, right now um, we're super excited to be starting work with some developers who I can't talk about yet on implementing games with natural conversations. Um, and looking forward uh, on that note, um, you know, there's also lots of cool stuff that I'm excited about, uh, particularly sort of, you know, doing contextual abuse monitoring in, uh, in online games, um, which is something that's obviously super important. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's another thing um, that I'm doing right now. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, just to sort of start wrapping up, um, you know, let's get excited about the future of VR, um, broadening the possibilities of what games will possibly be is exciting. Uh, but as practitioners and designers and players, uh, let's still bear in mind what our relationship with it looks like. It's still playful. Um, even if we're sort of aspiring towards social believability with NPCs, um, that should still be done in this sort of playful context. Um, and similarly, we don't, uh, when we're playing games, we don't become other people, right? But rather, we're always ourselves and we're always trying to better understand ourselves and each other by by looking through fresh eyes. So let's embrace that kind of critical play in our interactions with, with social AI, um, but also understand that it can be embodied critical play through taking advantage of the gaps in our simulation. Uh, because those gaps, those cracks, are where play happens. Uh, and as Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't know if we've got time for questions. Okay, cool. Questions? Nope. <laughs> yes? I, thought, I can't remember the name of the game now, um, but maybe you can just comment on this idea. And it's a VR game where in the game you're sitting on a couch with a controller in your hand mm -hmm. playing another game. Yeah. And so you're trying to play the game and then spooky horror stuff starts happening. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? And so yeah. the players felt like the brain can only process like one level of this dimension. 
so they felt like it was really happening to them because they were trying to play a game in this virtual world. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you did any work with stuff like that, like multiple layers to kind of make it feel more real. Yeah, I haven't done any work with it, but no, I think that's definitely super interesting. And I wonder if some of that sort of weirdness comes from the novelty of doing that. But certainly, I think, you know, that's a great example of, of doing that, sort of setting you up in opposition to sort of, you know, what you're doing, right? You're sort of suddenly, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about what it is you're doing on this sort of other level, right? Um, so I think, you know, that, that's a really super interesting uh, implementation. Um, uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, um, so, I mean, obviously, immersive is a dangerous word, um, of course, but no, um, certainly they, you know, they give you a sense of, like, you know, increased embodiment in the game, you know, whatever that means, right? And I think it just allows for a different kind of uh, relationship to the game. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's different. I don't think it's necessarily better. Um, and I think we can, um, we can design for experiences which, which take advantage of that. I am wondering whether you have thought of the, I guess, the genres involved, not only in terms of a narrative genre, but also an interface and kind of an embodied experience and how that plays a role into the design process. Uh, in terms of genre? Well, yeah, so I feel like the one of the really striking things about all the examples in the games that you presented mm -hmm. is that, for example, the interface of the interface genre seems to play a role in establishing expectations for how you will engage with the artifact. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, genre has always played a part in design, of course, right? Like it sets up context for what we're doing. Um, so I think, you know, it's no different um, in, in this context. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer your question. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, um, these, uh, you know, I, I was obviously in, you know, in my work, um, both, I suppose, you know, in my research work that I did and um, in sort of, you know, in through things like Redshirt, um, you know, I was just always really interested in getting people to sort of, you know, explicitly, uh, you know, subtly think about the world around them, right? So, um, you know, whatever that means. So, you know, and that doesn't necessarily have to be um, your goal, uh, but so yeah, you can absolutely work in a different genre, something that's more explicitly sort of like fictional or whatever, but yeah. Any other questions? Yes. No, absolutely not. No. Why did the talk make you feel guilty about it? Um, I felt like maybe I was taking advantage of people's emotion, and maybe I don't actually know the full extent of. But I think that's good. I think that's what you should be doing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Then a follow-up question: Do you feel like, from the experiences you did, like with the with the rock climbing, mm -hmm. did you feel like there were people's reactions that were way out there that you weren't expecting? No, some people did, yeah, and I think, you know, um, I think that's, uh, so, you know, the way that I uh, talk about um, the way that people, um, you know, because I think our relationship with, with games is always partly what we bring to the experience, right, and some people's uh, natural uh, experience of fiction is always the, you know, is, is, it, so for certain people, fiction is always just like, uh, even if they're watching a movie, they get super involved in it, and, uh, um, and, and can't bear to watch, for example. So, you know, it's the same thing here. And I think, you know, you just need to be uh, aware of the part that you're designing and recognize that the player is obviously bringing to it their own sort of attitudes. And, uh, yeah. Any other? Yep.
uh, that the player had, um, and by open I mean left to their imagination, uh, with the with the uh, female walker. <coughs> um, I, I guess I just wondered, kind of, a, I was trying to figure out how to sort of phrase this, and I still don't think I've discovered, but uh, I'm going to throw it at you anyway. Um, it, it's, what do you think the relationship, I guess, is between the amount of depth, uh, perhaps, that might be necessary um, from you know the narrative, uh, from kind of the writing, the backstory? Um, in a VR environment, do you think potentially that there's a need for, uh, for, for less in order to get the, the, uh, the user, the player, in uh, to a certain level? Um, or do you think it's just kind of you know, purely additive? Could it be, could some, could, could be less, uh, less need for um, as much context? Or you can think of kind of, a, you know, the, you know, you've got your book, which can be very engaging, and can draw you into uh, you know, an imaginary world quite, quite effectively. Uh, then you have you know a step up. You're, if you're watching, if you're watching a movie or whatever, then you're playing a game with maybe a handheld device, um, and then of course uh, you can be you know, moving around with uh, with some you know tactile controls or something. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it really just depends on the fiction of your game. Um, so in the rock climbing game, uh, yeah, it was yeah. She was this prescript NPC, and she would like you know just climb up the rock flip, rock face, uh, sort of you know just behind you. Um, and uh, and yeah, and she sort of had all these. Um, she had like an assortment of barks, basically, that she would that would just get triggered at um, at various different points in slightly different orders. Um, and um, and yeah, and you know, and, and all the barks are basically to do with like how you've been climbing together before, and isn't it nice to be doing this again? And so you know, setting up this context where um, you clearly have this pre-existing relationship with her, but you don't know what that is or like the nature of it, etc. Um, and all I can say is it worked for that particular particular example. And like you know, some players got super invested in her because um, she was showing investment in them. I guess I think that's probably the key part of it. Um, but yeah, I think you know, ultimately. You're, you know, it depends on the particular fiction you're creating in your game. Yes? Uh, so I'm curious, in that kind of game, so for the person to set up, what are your thoughts now about the kind of experience of their own show? I mean, you can have a game like that when you're I, I, I wanted to do that, actually. I really wanted to do that. Um, uh, I, I didn't get time with that, sort of, you know, in the context of doing like my PhD work. But um, yeah, that's definitely something I'd be interested in. Um, which um, yeah no I think that so one of the so what you know I, I explicitly made her um, I decided to make her a female character um, uh, but there was because you know there was uh, some decision around what her skin color should be actually um, and I was really going back and forth about like you know what skin color to have her as because you know there have been studies which obviously show, you know, different levels of, of empathy um, with, you know, depending on what your race is and like who, you know, your implicit racial bias, right? Um, so I sort of ended up sort of, you know, just basically um, making her sort of out of ambiguous ethnicity. So, you know, unless you're sort of looking, you don't know. But yeah, I would love to experiment with that more and see what, see what happens.